Join us Wednesday at noon for a studio interview with Victor Marks and Pastor James Cadiz. Hey, Victor Marks here. Hey, everybody, Victor Marks here. All things possible ministry. We started the Master of ATP really to offer them the hope and healing that we believe God offers for those who've experienced. I have ever watched anybody make about Victor Marks with one of his gun takedowns. Oh my goodness. Listen, if our intro is any indication of what today is going to be like, hold on to the seat of your pants because it is going to be a blessing. You guys are going to be blessed. I'm hoping and praying it is going to be a great time. So listen, really quickly, there is one thing that we would like you guys to do, and it is very, very important. Please, if you are watching this right now on Facebook Live, please make sure you like. If you have not subscribed, we would love you to do that. It's really, really, really important. As well, we want you to know that we've got lots of other places where we are broadcasting. Eventually, this will end up on our national radio show that it will, will happen very, very soon. But whatever you can do, jump in, let people know we're here. If you are on Facebook Live, get on there, type in We're Live, let them know. If you've got an Instagram account, let those folks know that you are also uh, around and you are watching. We want people to know because this is going to be a great show. Believe it when I say that. We have got the great Victor Marks with us. He is a blessing. And I cannot wait, truly, truly cannot wait to tell you about what God is doing. And so without further ado, let's, let's be our dear brother. Let's talk to him and say hello. I'm so glad you're here, Victor. Why don't you say hello to everybody? It's great to be here. And James, thank you for the opportunity to hang out with you for a little bit and get to know your folks. Uh, we, we really appreciate what you do um, on our side. Well, bro, we're totally honored, man. We're, 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 it's just such a blessing to have you here. And uh, I got to tell you, bro, God is so incredibly good. You know, he's faithful to us and he continues to show his faithfulness by everything uh, that he does. And I got to tell you, you know, I, you are just a blessing. I, this is what I would like to do before we start. I, I would really like for you to just tell us a little bit about your ministry what you do, because everybody knows you as uh, the gun takedown guy, right? But oftentimes they don't know you for uh, what you're all about, really, and, and the, really what you do in the ministry that you have. It's pretty unbelievable. And uh, I would just love to see, I would love people to kind of know what, what you're doing. Well, thanks. Yeah, I think the, the gun disarms uh, videos that are out there is what I'm best known for. And really, we, we only did those in the beginning to just try to hook people's attention on social media to where they would uh, actually follow the links to hear my testimony, which is, you know, sharing the gospel is, is the most important thing to us. But uh, so, yeah, I think we're like over 200 million views with uh, the gun disarm videos and like that, that fella who just, there, there's so many takeoffs and uh, fun stuff out there. We're, we're humble, but yeah, it, our ministry is called all things possible. It has multiple lanes of effort. We primarily try to identify people who are suffering from trauma, uh, intercept or interrupt what's causing the problem and then move toward hope and healing for them. And, you know, we started out, uh, gosh, <clears throat> with ATP, I think we're moving into year 19, uh, reaching kids who are incarcerated. <clears throat> that was the most concentrated effort of 
people we could find, young people that were hurting the most in America, uh, to the point to where they actually had to be incarcerated for crimes or high risk behavior uh, or mental illness. And we, we did that for years and still continue to do it. We just expanded our platforms uh, as God has given us people, prayer warriors, and the people who support the ministry, which again, is so humbling because it was just my wife and I and our kids. I mean, it, we travel around in a van, then a little motor home, uh, youth prison to youth prison. But God has, he, he has really blessed the effort. Then it grew in the other lines of effort. Uh, I think people most or most understand now is our efforts to help children and women who've been affected by terrorism or war, um, including those who were held captive by ISIS. And, uh, you know, we, we were, we got known enough for recovering and helping. And um, then it just grew into, and I know this is hard for some people to wrap their mind around, but we saw an injustice going on with children being abused by pedophiles. So we started a, a division of effort in our ministry to, to actually identify kids who were being hurt, um, and then interrupt the process by uh, hunting, going after the pedophile and seeking justice and, you know, which oftentimes is imprisonment. So, yeah, we, we, I mean, there's other things we do, but I think that's what we're best known for. Of course, helping with PTSD, our military. Um, and then I, I, it's something that's just popped up recently. I, I had a little role in a film that's actually doing really well. Uh, and it's called About Hope. And people can watch it. They can stream it from the home now. It's in theaters, but, uh, you know, it's just fun. I, the director kept asking me to do it, and I was doing pumps in and out of Iraq. And I, I was like, hey, David, David Dietrich, man, I don't have time, brother. And he goes, what? <clears throat> he goes, I, I wrote this this part for you. I said, I'm not an actor. He goes, <laughs> I wrote it for you. I said, what is it? He goes, it's a retired Marine who's a martial artist who's trying to help his son understand dating and love. And at times he's he's kind of rough around the edges. I said, "Oh, well, okay, then I'll do that." <laughs> <It's a> good <laughs> fit. <laughs> yeah. So I was surrounded by an incredible cast. Uh, some of them even Emmy Award winning. I mean, truly great crew. But the the film is family safe, and it's got a message, and it's entertaining. So I encourage people go stream that thing. About what's the name of the, what's the name of the film, bro? About hope is the name. About hope. Okay, we'll make sure we put some kind of a link to that in uh, in the description so that uh, yeah. people can g get a hold of that. And we're also going to be putting a link to all of Victor Marx's material so that you can g get it. Um, I, I think one of the things that I've identified with you really, really well in, and one of the things that I've appreciated you uh, appreciated about you, and have been really, really blessed, is your boldness, especially as it relates to the issues going on right now in the church. And um, we kind of live in a world that's being remarkably infiltrated by the garbage of critical race theory, by the ideals. I really believe of, of what you would look back and call a, a dialectic that Hegel called it, you know, this whole idea that there is no real truth that it's the pursuit of two things that diametrically are opposed to one another that kind of creates this sort of, uh, I don't know, new God for what they would call it. And um, it's crept into the church. Uh, it's not really crept into the church. It's literally walked into the church. And it's interesting because you seem to go out of your way, and, and, and I really love this, to point out the mechanisms that are driving this from within the church. Uh, and it's funny how you seem to almost, and, and I know you're not a lone voice. There's many like us that are out there, but it seems like you spend a good amount of time asking pastors to walk away from those ideals or to actually uh, dialogue about them because maybe there's a possibility they're just simply misinformed about what they're getting behind. 
You know, there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. So um, my my thought on this is, well, first, you know, what do you say about all of that? Because we're seeing it happening a lot. It's everywhere. And there's a lot of crazy things that are being said that we're being accepted to, to swallow hook, line, and sinker. And it's just really bad. So uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, well, first, let, let me back up and and ask questions to you that some of your some people that maybe aren't that fond of you <laughs> say or think. First of all, James, why are you so loud and obnoxious? <laughs> okay, so I I can answer this two different ways. All right, okay. I, the first thing that I could that I could say, and actually, it's a it's a reasonable question. A lot of people uh, don't, or or not a lot, but some people make comments about me being so loud, and it is a bit obnoxious to them. So there's two ways of addressing this. First of all, number one, to all of my uh, racially and ethnically sensitive folks out there understand that this is Middle Eastern culture, okay? Wherever you go in the Middle East, you are gonna meet people that are equally as loud as I am, especially those that are, uh, and by the way, for some of the comments that are coming in right now, uh, Victor does not think I'm obnoxious, but he's asking questions on behalf of people that do. I just want you to understand that. Um, but uh, we, we, we are allowed people. And we just tend to be, and you know, oftentimes it was probably one of the hardest things for my wife to get used to when we first got married. And, and it was kind of the idea of James, do you have a low volume? Is there a turn it down kind of a volume? And, uh, it, it's a bit of a personality thing, but here's the second thing. When, when I talk about a lot of the issues that we uh, are talking about right now, whether it be, uh, these biblical issues that are coming up, these issues that deal with morals and so on and so forth. I am, my whole heart is behind everything that I'm communicating. I feel like there's so little uh, reality that's out there right now that my heart and my desire is to be myself in the way that I actually communicate things. And oftentimes being myself, that kind of comes out. And, and the way, the, the best illustration that I like to give it is something that you definitely will understand. And that is if I have a friend that is on a motorcycle and they're going towards a wall at 80 miles an hour, okay, and they have no idea that they're about to hit the wall, I may, just to save their lives, take my arm and swing it right in front of them, knock them off the motorcycle, scream and yell, trying to warn them to slow down. If they don't listen, I'm going to resort to clotheslining them because I love them. Now, they might be mad at me because I initially screamed. They might be mad at me because I uh, clotheslined them, but once they wake up from their moment of unconsciousness only to find that their motorcycle has been blown up and slammed against the wall, they're gonna go back and go, oh, I understand why you did what you did. You had a passion for it because you didn't wanna see me hurt. Now, some people say, well, that can be accomplished by you know having a low volume and or, or maybe the way you represent things could maybe change a little bit. And I suppose it could, but that goes back to me acting and being the way that God designed me and made me to be. You know, by default, I tend to be very loud and I get it. I also believe, and this kind of sounds like a, um, I just for, for lack of a better term, um, people are also intimidated by the complex, the complexity of words sometimes, right? And um, I think oftentimes what happens is when you, uh, when you speak uh, using a certain set of vocabulary and a certain set of words that are oftentimes intimidating, it adds to the variability or to the variable of the loudness, the, you know, that kind of a thing. So I think it's a mixed bag with a lot of people and I've yeah. had some people, you know, s praise it. And I've had people like really curse it. So yeah, that's kind of the idea behind it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's interesting that, you know, whether it's sports or military or business, you can have that one guy who's hyper motivated and <clears throat> he's a he's a hard charger and people love it and embrace it. But then you put it in Christianity and the moment that it appears that it's not not, you know, nice, <laughs> people just get offended and they're yeah, you know, especially when they're on the receiving end, but <clears throat> It's a, yeah, I hear that. Here's the other thing I hear. Why don't you lose weight, man? Have you ever thought about losing weight? <laughs> 
oh, I love that one. I, I, I yeah. matter of fact, so I didn't know that that Victor was going to ask me all of these questions. I had no idea. He he didn't go over any of these questions for me. I. I truly wish I could take a picture of my office and send it your way. Maybe my guys can do it. Maybe my guys can run into my office, take one picture and send it to me. Um, I've lost 350 pounds. What? I, at, at one point, I was... Wait, say that again. At one point, I was almost 700 pounds and I've lost about 350. And I'm still on my way to lose a lot more. The the skin that you actually... the The, the bigger weight that you see is a lot of loose skin that eventually one day is going to end up being surgically cut off. I still have a lot more weight to lose. Um, there were some physiological reasons why I was as big as I was. Uh, I'm still fighting the fight. The reason why oftentimes people see me in a mobility scooter has nothing to do with my weight and my inability to actually walk. It has everything to do with a disease that I have called demyelinating polyperipheral neuropathy. It's a disease that basically affects uh, my nervous system that dramatically affects my balance because I have no feeling in my feet and oftentimes no feeling in my upper extremities. And that's a result of the nerve endings, predominantly the myelin sheath portion of the nerve that's actually damaged that affects the nervous system's ability to be able to send signals to the brain and then the brain being able to process um, how to be able to balance myself. Matter of fact, it's very interesting. I can walk and I walk without any problems but the way I walk now is I don't use the typical, um, the typical feedback that you might use when you walk. I actually, since I have no feeling in my feet, I have to tension my muscles and receive the feedback from the tensioning of my muscles to be able to give me the ability to balance myself. And so um, walking or standing up for an extended period of time would be the equivalent of you being in the gym and actually having worked out for a half hour. Um, it, it, it puts the same kind of exertion on my body. And so when you get tired from doing that, you end up making serious mistakes because you have no balance. And that's why in essence, I, um, I'm in that place. Um, so I will show you this. I'm going to see if I can, if I can run this over to my, um, to my picture. Let me see if I can do this. Cause I, I, I actually want to show this to you. I think it's, it's, it's a picture that you would actually really appreciate. Um, and what you're about to see is a picture of uh, my office, okay. So this is this is my office, and I, I got to convert it over so you can so I can put it on the camera. But um, let me see if I can grab it here. Uh, okay. While, yes. While you're grabbing that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to say to some of your detractors <clears throat> about your personal. I want you know, most of the time, it's it's uh, actually pastors who can't and couldn't sit across from you and have a dialogue or a debate. Right. So <laughs> so they get mad. I've had guys that we both know, and I said, well, hey, if you've got angst to get them, why don't you just get on the show? And I've literally heard from pastors, well-known pastors say, I'm not sitting across the mic from him. I'll be destroyed. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, Maybe that's just pride. Why don't you risk it? And, you know, are, are you the type of person, James, that if I got caught in your crosshairs because I got wrapped around an axle, would you do a video about me? And we're friends. No, no way. There'd be a conversation. Me, me and you would be talking. Uh, that, that, that would be my first attempt. My first attempt. So this is very interesting. Um, some of these people that have been saying, well, he shouldn't have made this video. He shouldn't have made this video. What they don't know is that there were multiple attempts to create dialogues about these things before any of these videos were made. Because my ultimate hope is you get on on the same public forum that you hold and you go back and you apologize and you say, I'm sorry for what I said because what I said was wrong and I shouldn't have said it, right? But unfortunately, that that is not in essence the dialogue that people want to have. Because for whatever reason, there are lots of people that kind of see, for whatever reason, they see the need to be able to be right more than they see the need to actually admit their fault and say, hey, this is, uh, this is a real problem for me. And that's actually what's, what's heartbreaking. But yes, it, every time yeah. that's happened, there has been an attempt. By the way, not just by people, not just by people that I know, but even people that I don't know. You know, if, yeah. if, I, if I see something on a video 
that um, you know really concerns me or bothers me, and I and I really want to deal with it, and I want to really fix it so that the body of Christ can understand kind of where we're at with things. Um, I, to me, it would be like one of those things where I would I would do whatever I can to get myself in that place of uh, confronting them so that we can fix it, and then they can go back themselves and remove it because. It's a bigger win when that happens, right? right? It's a it's right. a much bigger win. Well, that's the just... point. I'm, yeah, that's the point I'm wanting to make is uh, many Christians will watch news programs or people like Tucker Carlson or the, you know what they would consider confrontational journalists, uh, and yet in Christendom there's very few, and I think it's all based on a bunch of erroneous concepts. Of, hey, don't judge. Don't you know? Julie Roy's is is really an outstanding journalist, um, investigative journalist. I've had her on my radio program, and people should sign up for her newsletter to get dropped in their email box. Just julieroys.com. And you know, thank God there are people like her, like you, who are willing to challenge what is said. I mean, I, for you because you're a pastor, you've got. You've been on the radio for years. Uh, why would they not expect you to be a type of Berean to challenge? So the point I was making with me is, let's say I let's say I didn't want to have a conversation with you, and now I'm, I'm part of the James Hayton group. Got my card. <clears throat> no doubt. Would you still do a video and expose stuff that I was saying? Well, it it would depend. I th I think the other thing that would have to happen is I think the Lord would have to lead me. I mean, I, I would it would have to be one of those things where I would just have to be. I would have to know that that was something that the Lord wanted me to do, and and then in essence, I would do it when I felt like I I had the ability to do it. Right? Uh, but, I mean, the the permission, for lack of a better yeah. term, to do it. So but I do think. But yeah. I do think we have a, a, re, a responsibility to expose this. This is a, a simple concept in the book of Timothy. It talks about publicly exposing these things. Um, well, and, that's, what I, that's what I want people to understand. You're not a sniper. Right. Up on a, you know, in a hidden hide, you know, popping people and not wanting dialogue. You'll dialogue with anybody yep. that you have 100%. a disagreement with. And... Um, Sometimes your delivery and your enthusiasm and seeming, you know, volume of your voice makes people go, this is wrong. You should be more loving. And, and it, it, you hear all these things. He's judging. He's loving. Because I do. Sure. And I, I'll just say one thing about me. And it probably holds true for you, but I was in a conversation with a pastor yesterday, and I think he he wrote a, because I posted your video, you know, uh, I posted your video about Brian Broson. So this guy direct messages me. He's a Calvary Chapel pastor, and he just said, "Hey," but he posted it on my wall. This comment, he says, "You know, you've got Brian Broson on the crosshairs." Uh, but yet you may be the one drifting from the gospel. And he, right. you know. That's right. Yeah, I mean, because, so I thought, well, this is a Calvary Chapel pastor. Uh, I'll go direct to him. So I went direct to him, which he didn't to me. He posted on social media. And it, one, that's the same thing when people go, you should go direct. But why didn't you? To me. Right. You could have gone direct message. Now, I can't answer all my direct messages and I have a team. We get upwards of 10,000 comments a day sometimes. But him, I did. And then he's, you know, I responded to him publicly. I just said, look, in essence, I was, I, in essence is what I said. I'm not a nice person. I, I, because I, he goes, I'm sure you're a good man. I said, I'm not even a good man. Really? I'd rather be known for being good at being a man and I'd rather be known as kind not nice nice people are filled in the ministry pastors, leaders they're nice to get stuff so are guys who want to get in a girl's drawers when they date her they'll be nice to get something 100%. and people like that 
I don't put a lot of weight in or trust. Kind people will do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Right. You know, they'll honor the girl. They won't take advantage of her. Or when they administer, they won't manipulate people <clears throat> to get what they want. So, yeah, I do have a hard time with currently the state of the American church in Christendom and how I love the solid pastors that are doing the deal. But, you know, in, in our circles, we, we know they are. But I think it's dangerous for us not to say things when pastors are influencing people incorrectly. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, look, the, the thing, it, 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 there's a much bigger issue at hand here. And the bigger issue is what are we willing to do for the flock of God that he's entrusted us with? I think this is a thing that people just don't understand or recognize or realize here. We, we as pastors, and you are one, you've been a pastor for a very long time. The first, the first place where you ever served in ministry was under Brian Broderson, if I remember correctly, as a pastor. The, the, yeah. the, this, is, this is a major problem that we find ourselves in, in that uh, pastors are, are people who are so worried and so fearful about what, what people are going to think about them that they oftentimes will keep themselves from uh, speaking the truth because speaking the truth can be detrimental to uh, what they're actually trying to produce. And it's actually a very sad thing. Uh, by the way, really quickly, before I do forget, let me show you this. I wanted to show you this picture going back to answering your last question so that we don't forget. Um, this right here is um, the door in my office. If you look at that, if you look at the door, you'll see that right by the door, there's a belt that's hanging there. It's hanging from the top above the door. So you can get an idea. That belt is above a seven foot door. Okay. And that's going all the way to the ground. That was the belt that Whoa. I used to wear at my heaviest. I was on, I was on the very last hole. That was wow. the belt that I used to be on at my, at my heaviest. So by the incredible and immense grace of God, um, I've been able to lose that kind of weight. And, and of, course it, it's, of course, it's with the help of the Lord, right? The, it's the Lord who, um, who did that for me. And, and I, will t I will tell you that when you look at something like this, it is a great reminder to me of uh, the God that gave himself for me and has continued to give me strength. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, listen, it did not come without a lot of discipline and a lot of difficulty and a lot of hardship. Uh, but it was something that by God's grace, I had the ability to be able to do. And I'm continuing to, it's, it's one of these things. So for that, you know, oftentimes people get upset with me and in their anger, they will make reference or talk about my, um, my weight. And it's because they have nothing else to revert to the, the way that I like to look at it oftentimes. And it's, and it's very, very sad, but I will say this, uh, the way that I, I like to refer to it is. Uh, the illustration of when you go to the zoo and you kind of see a monkey that's in their cage and they're, they're rattling their cage and they want their banana and they, they lose their ability to be able to articulate their position. So they get mad and they throw feces at you. <laughs> that's exactly what people do when they are incapable of being able to articulate themselves. It oftentimes manifests itself in bad language. It manifests itself in, um, in, a, in a way where people behave viciously or respond with anger. And, and what happens is when somebody sees what's going on and they are incapable of articulating what the actual issues are, they will resort to personal attacks like this. Oh, he's too loud. Oh, he's fat. Oh, he's, he's mean. Oh, look at, he's uh, narcissistic. He's into himself. He's that. All of that stuff is superfluous. The, the bigger issue that you have to look at is what's the truth in this matter? What, what, what is actually going on? Because here's the deal. The Bible for me is my final arbiter, right? That's really where the issue is. And perhaps one of the greatest exhibitions of spiritual leadership is when somebody who is in that position has the ability 
to turn around 180 degrees based on the correction provided to them in the word of God. And one of the best things that I can do for the flock that God has entrusted me to is to remember the obligation and the responsibility that God has given me to be someone who is yielded to his word when his word shows me otherwise. And oftentimes that's a problem that a lot of people have. It's one of these things that they, they, they just can't find themselves in a position to do. But the body that we minister to becomes the greatest beneficiary of our willingness to be corrected, especially when we're being corrected by what's true. You know, and that's that's kind of the, the thing that's very difficult for many people to understand, and which is why oftentimes these personal attacks come in. And you'd be amazed seeing some of the attacks people have made against me. I mean, it's crazy, especially with some of the recent videos I've made. It is it is unbelievable. I've been called all kinds of things. But what's funny is none of them have been based on the merits of the actual issues brought up. They've all been personality issues. You're a big fat this. You're here. You're there. Blah, 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 blah. You're a hustler. You're da, da, da. But there's no real discussion about the merits of what's actually happening, which is why we're getting what we're getting. And it's very sad, but it's the reality of what we see uh, day in and day out. I agree with you. And um, too many times pastors isolate themselves. Now, granted, there's a bunch of crazy people out there, you know, that'll wear you out. And that I get. But pastors will isolate themselves and surround themselves with yes men and people who, who actually won't even lovingly challenge them. Like, because uh, we all have blind spots. You know, my staff... Although we're not a, you know, we're not a Sunday church. We're, we're a, a different type of ministry. <clears throat> or we have teams in different parts of the world. I mean, right now, I just got back from Iraq. We have operations going on in Cambodia. We have a safe house. We're, we're planning South America, south tip of Mexico. We, we've got, we're moving and grooving. And even at our training center, leadership and training center, but one thing it always boils down to is leadership. And I tell people, folks on our team, um, every one of them could lead and be a leader in their own right in the specific area that they're gifted and called to. And pastors and leaders in ministry, they need to start surrounding themselves with extremely capable people. Yep. Who you're not intimidated by their skill sets and their experience. But you realize that, you know, it's it's a team and an effort that will only increase. Uh, my COO, for example, he's kind of, an, you know, a great, great example is he retired from the U.S. Army Special Operations community 25 years. Uh, but his last decade was spent in Delta, uh, which everyone knows it's, you know, it, it, the special missions unit of CAG, uh, the work that they do is extremely unique through selection and qualification and then staying on the team. Jeff Teagues, Colonel Teagues is his name, he had a thousand missions, James, and never lost a man. Hmm. Uh, that's exceptional hmm. in, in any degree. Uh, uh, five bronze stars and a silver would have been for valor. And, you know, we have special operations team members in a ministry. We've got missionaries who did the deal, uh, the hard deal as missionaries without fanfare. We, we get servants. Everybody's a servant, but we're all big people. And none of us are afraid of uh, discussion, dialogue, and challenge. And, hey, I'll tell people right now, there have been many people that didn't make it. They came to us. We even vetted them. Now we have a very intense process of selection and qualification because people always want to be on a team. We literally have someone. We do extensive background checks. And then uh, one of our interviewers was an interrogator of high-value targets, over 3,000 uh, interrogations he had. People will sit down and have to go through that with him. Again, um, Jeff Teagues, Colonel Teagues has a, a phrase, when me and him aren't agreeing, in the, the, the generic sense, he goes, Victor, we're in violent agreement. Yeah. And I like that. I love that. 
yeah, it, it, it means we don't have to feel good about this. We don't have to have a lot of kumbaya. We're, we're saying the same thing in different ways. Let's get to the middle so we can execute. And, uh, and I, I would love to see Christians mature, especially in ministry in this, just being challenged. And the pastor like going, oh, yeah, no, I'm good with that. So that's why I asked you, because <clears throat> I believe if I went off the rails, if I was wrapped around and act so bad, if I was doing stupid stuff that was affecting many because of, you know, uh, I mean, I think last week we crossed for the year, I mean, over 200 million. Easily. Uh, Easily. Yeah, it, it's, it's insane the level of responsibility we have with social media. Uh, and millions engage us each week. I mean, literally engage us. <clears throat> but if I went off the rails, man, it, I, I think you would pop smoke on me. And I think you would make a video and say, look, Victor's a friend. He's a brother, <clears throat> a co-laborer, a colleague, fellow warrior. I He is not responding to me. And we need to be concerned both. We need to pray for him. And I'm challenging him on this. This is what he said. You know, roll tape or whatever. Uh you know, he's he's running down the beach, uh, painted like William Wallace, butt naked. <clears throat> and uh, well, the, the good news is, is I don't think I would have to do something like that because I think the moment we had a conversation, uh, you've got the the character and the presence of mind to just respond. You know, th this oh, is the one thing. Th yeah. This is the one thing I say about you to a lot of people, and they don't understand it. Matter of fact, I've said it to my church. And they don't get the phrase. They don't understand it. They actually think that I'm crazy when I make statements like this. But I think you have what they call the gift of violence. Now, don't get me wrong. The gift of violence does not mean, you know, the ability to go out there and in an unmitigated fashion go out and hurt people and so on and so forth. What I right. mean is, is it is a, if you were to look at the biblical term, the biblical term I think would be meekness. I think that you have this ability to be able to exercise an insane amount of, uh, of power, uh, physical power, to be able to come out with a result that saves people's lives, right? Um, we, we are people that are staunchly opposed to political violence and, and things like that. Those things are evil, right? But, but yeah. what, we, what, what we do is we understand that there are men who have obligations and responsibilities given to them by the Lord to stand up for righteousness, and we do it from within different contexts, right? For example, the context in which I would do it from is I would stand from the think tank perspective supporting uh, the work that gets done that most people will never see in their life, most people will never be exposed to. You have to understand that 80, probably 5% of the people that are alive right now in the United States of America won't be exposed to some of the things that you get exposed to in a single day. And, and the problem is, is if we did not have men like that, which is why I so staunchly hate the defund the police movement, which is why I hate this disgusting mechanism that's continuing to drive uh, ungodliness, especially from within the churches. Um, uh, if we did not have men like you, we literally, we literally would be in a place where this, worth, this earth would be in, in such complete chaos. I mean, the kind of chaos that I mean, we think it's chaotic right now. I mean, wait and wait till you see what happens when we lose yeah. men like that. And that's yeah. why your ministry is so valuable. It isn't just the fact that, yes, God has given you the ability to communicate with people. He's given you the ability to reach out to people, make a difference in the ministry that you have, the social media, all of that stuff. But people don't get the fact that while uh, you appear to be posting certain things on social media, you're well behind some very, very dark doors that uh, most people will never understand. And I'm not, I'm not saying that just to say it and, and to sound, oh, this is, you know, it's, it's so, these doors, folks, just to our listening audience, let me just help you understand something. These doors are so dark that if we took a moment to actually describe them, you would think we were cuckoos making things up and you would send us away to the cuckoo house. That's exactly it, the way it would be. Why? Because the human mind was not designed to comprehend or uh, a process or understand the level of evil that people like Victor get exposed to every day, which is why men like us 
pastors, uh, teachers, uh, men that are seeking God have this staunch responsibility to be able to make sure that the mind and the heart of men like Victor stay pure, clean, and focused. Because without that, then we get to pure violence, pure destruction, no mitigation of anything, and people suffer. And that's yeah. exactly the, the issue that we have to contemplate for a second. <clears throat> you know what? I'll spike that point of reality. You know, I said I just recently got back from Iraq. I think it was my 14th mission into Iraq. <clears throat> we had a four-man team, two were former Delta operators, very accomplished, and, and both love God. I mean, both are committed Christians, <clears throat> family men. And you probably couldn't pick either one of them out in a room. Yep. <clears throat> and, but here, here's a great case in point. Uh, I challenge any pastor out there or ministry leader who would maybe not fully understand what we do and it's unique and that's okay. But uh, I wouldn't talk disparagingly about things that God's doing that they don't really understand. Um, and I'll share this with you. I, I, I haven't shared this publicly, but I, I will, is as part of our mission uh, set of what we were doing in Iraq, we ended up in a special operations fob with uh, a very small group of the uh, most probably well-trained, experienced guys in the Middle East right now who've done the deal unbelievably and have hunted and killed monsters. I mean, people that would burn babies, use drills to extract, you know, information from innocent people, mutilate, oh, we're talking ISIS, Al-Qaeda, terrorists that are so evil and thank God for these men and women who, who do the hard work and we were brought into a, a very very you know uh, setting but here's what's amazing uh, the team lead for that unit we end up praying for him spent time praying for him to help with the demonic oppression that comes on good men and women who fight what we call the manifestation of evil. And that's where this righteous violence is needed because when evil manifests and will kill you, uh, sometimes righteous violence is the only thing that will stop that, regardless of what some people who tend to be, you know, uh, more pacifistic, and I'll tell you, I appreciate true pacifists. Uh, I don't, I don't appreciate men hiding behind passive, you know, passivity, thinking that it's part of their conscious and it's it, when they're really just cowards. This one individual, I can tell you right now, after prayer, I gave him one of my knives, one of my blades, and then he pulled this out, James. He pulled this out of his pocket. Oh and this wow. Is, it's a, it is a custom one of a kind. And, uh, Oh, wow. He, <laughs> he said, I want you to have, I want you to have my blade, my working everyday carry blade. And he goes, I can tell you right now, it's been used a lot. Hmm. Um, and you know, we end up doing training there. Uh, and I, uh, we've been training good men and women to do, you know, righteous violence. I mean, for many, many years. Uh, and then to be put in these situations where you've seen the evil. Well, I thought that was interesting. This was, this was a warrior's way to say, this is the best thing I can give you. In which I said, well, I'll make sure and wash it before I cut an apple with it. <laughs> <laughs> Now, there are some men watching right now, and that actually fills their heart with warmth because they've been there. They understand, hey, what's that good-looking woman behind me? Hey. <laughs> hey. 
And it's why do we do life. it? Why do we stand in the gap? Why do we risk lives? Why do good men and women fight the forces of darkness that manifest? It's all out of love. It's for people like that. It's for children. It's, you know, it's done out of love. And I tell people, you know, you can get hard doing this type of work, uh, but if you stay close to God, he'll just strengthen your backbone uh, and keep you out of the, the darkness, even though you have to live and move and groove in it. Uh, it's why it's so important to have good pastors. And you know what? I've got friends who are solid pastors who will text or call me at any time. And I even go to them sometimes and go, hey, am I seeing this right? Do I have a blind spot? Let me know. And, and I appreciate uh, godly men who, who can rightly divide the word of truth and, uh, and are very good in that battlefield space, which are one of them. Well, it's, it's, it's an important discussion for us to have right now because, I mean, rea realistically speaking, um, people will oftentimes hear certain words like, uh, for the good of all, uh, for the sake of the gospel. Uh, these terms get thrown around a lot, and oftentimes yeah. when those uh, terms are thrown out, it seems to create this sort of cover that gives license for people to make statements that are uh, really evil uh, and, and truthfully um, broken into little pieces. Um, for example, we oftentimes find ourselves in a position where we have to, me personally, in, in confrontation, we have to repudiate terminology that is so much inspired by the world, but yet covered under the color of... Uh, for the gospel, this is what the Bible says, That's so on so and so true. forth. And, and, and what we find is, right now, the worst of it, the, the greatest of the poisons that we're seeing right now, is based on, um, and, and I, I oftentimes don't talk about it deeply because this is a type of thing that takes a lot of nuancing to be able to demonstrate and illustrate to people, but it's under the color of what John Hagel called his dialectic, right? It, th this is the idea that the... Uh, you can have a thesis, you can have an antithesis. They both contradict one another, right? Both people on both sides are claiming they have the truth, but they're all supposed to coexist with this sort of synthesis. And the idea is the pursuit is no longer what is true. The pursuit is literally dismantling what is true in the name of both sides coexisting together. And, and I'm over, way oversimplifying it. Matter of fact, it's interesting. The best description I have ever heard or the best takedown I have ever heard, uh, hands down, even more than many of the modern guys that do such a good job with it, uh, concerning this principle is Francis Schaeffer. If you have an opportunity, read his complete works. In my opinion, one of the greatest philosophers that ever lived and was probably the most biblical philosopher I've ever heard. Uh, just brilliant. But, but what's happening is this is all happening in the name right now of the gospel. The Southern Baptist Convention has uh, idealized it. Calvary chapels have in many contexts. Uh, this is the type of thing. What used to be the flagship of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, where Pastor Chuck was a man who spoke directly against many of these things, has now become sort of the open door for all of these things to come in. And it's all being done in the name of the absorption of uh, social justice, which, by the way, I hate. Uh, I, I hate that term. And the reason why I hate that term is because when you look at the Proverbs, the Proverbs make it very clear to us. I believe it's Proverbs chapter 28, verse 5, where it says that evil men do not understand justice, do not know justice, but the righteous understand all. 
And so when the world says that they are pursuing the mechanism of social justice, no, they're not. They're pursuing what I believe to be the core of a demonic approach towards something, which is why this time was the most ideal time. This last year and a half has been the most ideal year and a half for the enemy to play. Because while many of these pastors were keeping their churches shut down, they were still marching for social justice. They were breaking the rules that they claimed to hold up. They were doing the things that they wanted to do uh, in order to sort of create whatever ambiance they wanted to, to kind of create the picture they want people to have of them in the name of, of uh, holding on to legacy instead of marching for the truth, standing up for righteousness and doing what's right. And I think that yeah. that's the problem. Instead of marching for the truth, they were marching for social justice, which social justice is perhaps the worst thing that can happen. And I'll just say this very quickly. If you love the black community, if you love the community of minorities, and by the way, not that I would ever give credence to the ideals of intersectionality. So I, in other words, I do not believe that my race or my background or my ethnicity should establish moral authority, right? But I fall under the American with Disabilities Act. My mom and dad were born and raised in Egypt. That's a North African country. I'm first generation into this country from that place. I represent 1% of the population, right? What they say about the United States of America is patently untrue. I was just recently accused by a pastor, one of your friends, of not understanding the Constitution. I would love for that guy to come on with me. Get, just do me one favor. Quote even one quarter of the preamble. Talk to me about one of the, the sections of it and, and we can have the conversation. But that's beside the point. Let me just simply say, if you really cared about black people... The issue is not what they perceive to be happening right now, what these mostly white folks who want to make up for their guilt or whatever it is. It's not what they see. This nation was built on a promissory note that MLK actually said. It's an extremely important one. And that promissory note he referred to was the Declaration of Independence and, of course, the Constitution. Now, I will just simply say this. These were inspired by the Word of God. But let me take it one step further. We live in the greatest country in the world. Okay, so the problem is not with police officers hunting down black men. Okay, 385 million contacts were made with law enforcement uh, two years. I'll just use the 2019 statistic, the one before George Floyd. And I have all of the statistics all the way into 2021. But 385 million contacts were made with law enforcement officers uh, in 2019 with citizens, right? That's 385 million times represented. Uh, officer says, hi, how are you doing? Or, hey, get your hands up. Whatever it is, 385 million times. Of that, there were 1,000 officer-involved shootings that ended in serious injury or death. Of that, 40 of them were unarmed. Of the 40 that were unarmed, you know how many were black? Nine. Of the nine that were black, six of them were attempting to take the weapon of the law enforcement officer, and of the six, three were actually caught on video. So statistically speaking, that is not the problem. Now let's talk about the problem for just one second. The greatest civil rights of our time is the fact that 3%, 3% of the childbearing population in this country are black women. 3%, yet they represent close to 50% of the abortions that are taking place in this country. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what our biggest civil rights issue problem is, it's 1,500 little black babies being killed every single day in this country. That's our biggest problem. And, and I'll just add one more uh, thought to this, and it's very important to, to say. And that is the fact that in 1911, in the year 1911, we knew that 11% of black households did not have the father in it. When you hit the fast forward button, you get to 1960. In the 1960s, 25% of black households did not have a father. Mm -hmm. Then you've got Lyndon Bay Johnson who makes a deal, who basically says that what he wants to do is create a program that will help single black mothers and goes to these black mothers and says, we'll pay you for each child you have so long as there is not a father present. We hit the fast forward button and almost 80% of black households right now in this time do not have a father. That's the problem. That's the real issue. And these pastors that run around talking about social justice, using worldly terminology and seeking to combat all of that, they need to quit the ministry. They need to repent or quit the ministry because they are contributing to the murder of these children every single day. And they're making it worse for black communities, not better. Uh, 
I gotta get off the my soapbox. Facts, Sorry. No, brother. The facts scare people on who, for some reason, need that not to be said. They don't want to talk about that, and I always chuckle when people come against me and say, you're not doing anything. You know, you're just worried about the preborn children. You're not doing anything for children who don't have a father and are struggling and single moms. And, and first of all, my first thought is, well, you're just stupid. Yep. And then my second thought is, well, maybe it's just ignorance and you don't know. And I tell people, stop making lazy comments. Google me at least because you don't even know who I am and what we do. First of all, I was raised on a single with a single mom. She married a lot, but none of them stuck. She married six times. I know, I know what it's like. To, I know what it's like to see her work 12, 14 hours. She purposely never went on governmental assistance because of her fear of being caught in a trap. She had six kids. And uh, and then I tell people, so I know that pain firsthand. The, the thing that really discourages me is when they don't even understand that we've been helping women and children, I mean, for all these years, practically, uh, getting people out of sex trafficking, uh, recovering children, working with U.S. Marshals, I mean, American law enforcement, prosecutors, uh, and then overseas, where we've caught and captured people that would have never been caught for raping babies, for hurt. They were people with money who were untouchable, but because of the, you know, because of the, the power of prayer, those people who really pray for our works. Our teams have been able to do, our teams, our extended teams have been able to do unbelievable things. So it breaks my heart when people start playing victim mentality. And that that is very prevalent in the US. Uh, when people would rather be a victim than a victor, uh, they would rather just justify trying to survive versus thrive. And God, as a Christian, God has so much more than that. And I'm not, now look, I understand struggles. I, I was on a psychiatric care. I had 123 visits in a nine month period. I've been on Depakote, Depakote, Prozac, Zoloft, Lithium. But I was also abused as a kid, left in a commercial cooler to die. I understand mental health issues and challenges and, uh, and I wish I could say I was perfectly healed, but I'm not. As my wife says, it's a good reminder that I never forget those who suffer. Yep. And, Amen. And, and I thank God for godly wives who will actually stand, not run, not give up on their spouses. Uh, and it goes both ways. And that's, uh, it, look, James, Look at the state of our nation yep. and tell me some of it doesn't have to do with the responsibility of the church mm. and the pulpit. I, I blame all the church. I, I, I think I think the church is all responsible for it. I, it's it sounds like a like a tremendously horrible thing, but it's all responsible. And and I and I'll just say this, just so that so that you're aware of where I stand with this. I think that when a man, especially a man in the church, makes a statement like this, they're a complete coward. The, the bottom line is they are, they are complete and total cowards. And the reason why I say that is because, like you said, first of all, they're lazy. They're not willing to speak the truth. But it's ridiculous, right? Because here's my, here, like, even on that statement where you talk about these people that accuse you of not doing anything for people when they're born, you know, after they're born and so on and so forth. Here's my statement to them. You're a fake. You don't give a rip about the life of the person who is living right now because you tried to kill them before they were born. So if you tried to kill them before they were even born, you have no authority to tell me whether or not I'm taking care of them afterwards. You just lost 
your moral card because you tried to kill them before. If, if, put it this way. If, if I come up to you, if you come up to me and you say, James, I want to make your life better and I want to take care of you, but then I have direct knowledge of the fact that you tried to kill me when I was in my mother's womb, why should I trust you? You have no concept of what uh, quality of life is. You're a fake. And this is well, the lying narrative that continues to get communicated within the church. Well, why can't it be both and instead of either or? Right. Why can't people 100%. who are far, so far, you know, helping single moms and children, why can't they be equally concerned about the most vulnerable, which are children in the womb? That's what, that you know, that's what Burr got under my saddle before the election and all, when these pastors, so many of them wouldn't take a stand against Kamala Harris and the Biden ticket. And believe me, politics, that ain't our salvation. DC is not our savior. Yep. Uh, but you have to choose who would protect life more. And that's when I started losing total respect for people who wouldn't take a stand. They just stayed quiet. And they justified it. I'm like, you know what? Come with me to Iraq, get in a battle, get in a heated situation where you've got to try to get a kid or women out of a situation. And being neutral and quiet doesn't work. 100%. It doesn't work. 100%. And, and, uh, you, you know, it's, it's these children who don't listen. I don't even talk about early term abortion. I just go all the way to full term. That's where we're at, where people will legislate the murder, the child sacrifices of a baby for. And, and you know what, Here, here's the other thing. I, you know, it goes on both. I hear people saying, well, you know, I would, people talk a lot. And if, you know, people have to say stuff, I have very little, you know, I, mean, I don't want to get that about, about doing the real deal because I've seen pastors and people in real life situations, even from the dojo training combatives. I've taken people overseas who, man, you know, they need to change their britches when it comes down for real life stuff. But you put them in a an abortion mill, you put them in a Planned Parenthood and let them kill a child. Let them see a baby and then they have to kill that baby. Let's see if they would change their point of view. 100%. I call it thin data and thick. So many people with thin data are making so many, so many, you know, uh, tr truly so many, uh, allegations about what they would and wouldn't do and it to me it's heartbreaking and it's not realistic for any of them listen 100 percent. i mean completely 100 percent. and that's why i fight the way that i fight because it's gone beyond that now it's getting to the point where pastors are contending for things that are ungodly by sounding like the world here's a great example this was one of the ones that caused me to to start all of this but take a look at this and this is sad this is a pastor. This is a guy in the ministry. He puts up a post like this, okay? And I'll, and I'll go to a full screen so that everybody can actually see the full screen. He says, why do we cry out for justice in the womb, but not justice to the tomb? What a hugely erroneous statement to make. What The, the, the idea here is, is you are minimizing the cry for justice, the proverbial cry for justice to the womb, right? Or justice for the womb and then not for the tomb, you're minimizing it. The problem is if you don't have a comprehensive approach to saving a child before the child is born, you will never develop the sensitivity necessary, especially by the Holy Spirit, to develop a comprehensive plan to minister to the child themselves after they're born. People don't get that. People don't get the fact that when a child is in the womb of their mother, they're still a child. They're still a baby. They, they, they don't get that. But this is what the world does. The world chooses to continue to be like and extend uh, itself to evil. But when the church does it, when the church chooses to say, I want to adapt 
the philosophies of the world. By the way, that statement, just so that you know, that statement, Victor, was one that was taken right out of the book of Black Lives Matter. That is a Black Lives Matter chant. That is one of the things that they say. They scream that out. So, so when a statement like that ends up getting made, do not ever tell me that you care about the rights of black people. Whether or not you're black, don't tell me you care about the rights of black people. You don't care because you're making a statement that minimizes abortion, right, at the expense of of seeking what you think is social justice when you haven't even identified or taken the time to understand what it is. And the man that put that up, make no mistake about it, is a critical race theorist. He is a bigot and a racist. And he, there are videos that he... Say again? Who put that up? That's Tony Clark. Tony's a friend of mine. He's a fellow Marine. and He, stood, this, in my, he stood in my wedding, Victor. You know, we simply don't agree uh, on that. But it's, it's uh, you know, I would invite Tony to come on this program. Have you ever had him on for him to discuss his point of view? He, he refuses. He won't do it. He won't do All right, it. So he, people, just, just remember that. And um, Matter of fact, I, you might remember this, but um, I – you came to me and talked to me about let's try to do something like that. You begged him. Yeah. You did everything you could. You worked very hard. You developed a dialogue with him. You begged him to come on the show and to have a conversation, and he refused. Yeah. So, you know, I don't understand why guys who get challenged on this won't at least come on. Now, they'll go on shows but people like-minded. Uh with their point of view, but it's, you know, come on, we can do better than that. We're better than that. And, you know, speaking of men, the reason why these older pastors should be challenged uh, is because there are young men looking at them and watching them and their influence matters. Yep. Uh, it, it, what has shocked me is that over the years in the Calvary Chapel movement, we'll just, we'll just talk about Calvary's, how many guys are so good at teaching the word of God, but yet when it comes time for taking practical hard stances, they don't have the courage to, or because they feel they have more of the side of the world behind them, uh, then they can. I mean, when, when somebody like, uh, who's that singer, Lecrae? When, when Matt fella, because I challenged his position on promoting those guys, I was absolutely stunned when he did a concert for that fella running. Raphael Warnick. Yeah, who's a pastor who he's said a, abortion is biblical. He's a, de he's a demonic mean, man. Yeah, it's demonic. And, and, I, and he was, yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't get it. It's, it's easy to lob grenades uh, from a bunker, you, you know, when there's not anybody around. It all looks good. But these people need to come out of their bunkers and engage in real dialogue um, to find out really why, why would you post stuff like that? Why would you take positions? The, and and uh, that, that, that is a terrible thing because when I came against Lecrae publicly – and I made a video. It, it got millions of views because it was shared by Charlie Kirk. And so it, it struck a nerve. And basically, when Brian Broderson, who oversees K-Wave, found out about that, he kicked me off K-Wave. Now, don't get me wrong. Getting kicked off of K-Wave, Victor, was the greatest thing that could have ever happened to me. Because when that happened, Salem Communications called me. We jumped on KKLA almost immediately. And now we're on over 600 radio stations nationwide. So the, the, God, God did that. He was able to do that his, because of his faithfulness. And a lot of that was created because of what had actually uh, happened or what had taken place. But there's no excuse for Lecrae. Lecrae should not have done that way or for his actions. There was no excuse for, uh, for any of that. And the problem is, is they continue to bring it out. I, I would like you to respond. I want to play a video for you, right? And by the way, right. I, I want to just say this. I wanna, actually, I want to play a couple of videos. The leadership, people ask me why I come against stuff like this. Because the leadership of a person like Brian Broderson brings to the table significant detriment 
it hurts people badly, okay? I could give you a great example of this. There's a guy that he has on him on, with, on him with pastor's perspective. He calls himself the one-minute apologist. He has a lot of very biblical uh, errant views. I'm just, I'll just leave it that. Some of his views are very, very wrong. I'm not going to get into it. But if you want to talk about bigotry at its finest... Let me play this video of him on pastor's perspective. And I want you to understand what's happening here. The context of the conversation is the fact that he's starting a church. He's starting it back East and he is explaining why he will not release uh, his people out there to go start the church. This is his explanation for why. And uh, I'm just telling you right now, Victor, brace yourself. Because when you take a listen to this, uh, it's, it's, it's reprehensible. It's disgusting, but take a listen to what he has to say. Have to hold up the brakes a little bit when we've yeah. got a, a good core team developing, yeah. but we're all white. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hesitant to go public, uh, because I want to reflect the vision that we're wanting to reach out yeah. to the community. So it's almost like, so I don't know if you caught that we've, he says, we've got a great core team, but we haven't gone out and started anything because we're all white. So in other words, I'm not going to preach the gospel. I refuse to go out and preach the gospel because my, the color of my skin, the melatonin that I have does not meet the requirement to be able to do so. This is the mindset. And then when that kind of leadership continues, you get things like this. And this one, this one is particularly offensive to me only because I know the ministry of men like you. And I actually did a whole video on this. I spent an hour on this. I did a live video on this. As a matter of fact, I bought you up as an illustration when, um, when he talked about the fact of, well, anyway, it's, it's a whole other story, but I want you to listen to this and I'd like to get your response on this. It is somewhat lengthy, so I'll stop it at certain points, but I'd really like you to kind of hear what he has to say. By the way, to set this up, this is Char Broderson, the son of Brian Broderson, who is making a statement about what he calls toxic masculinity. By the way, that is a blatantly unbiblical, patently unbiblical term, okay? Because what he defines as masculinity is even broken. But let's just take a listen to it. I, I'd really like you uh, to take a listen to this and let me know uh, what you think. Not just okay with the status quo. It's a place where meekness is practiced treasured and praised i think about you know in my years of being in the church in my years of being in pastoral ministry i have seen how hyper masculinity has hijacked the church i'm going to i'm going to do this really quickly bro i'm going to restart it so that um uh, you can hear it and it's, I just raised the audio level. So I'm going to restart it so you okay. can hear it a little bit more clearly. Cause I saw you struggling, which means probably most of the audience, um, is struggling with the, with the volume. So I'm increasing it so that you can hear it a little louder and hopefully, uh, everybody will be able to hear it a little bit better. So let's start over again. Not just okay with the status quo. It's a place where meekness is practiced treasured and praised i think about you know in my years of being in the church in my years of being in pastoral ministry i have seen how hyper masculinity has hijacked the church and i don't want to get on my own political soapbox but there are many people in this country that see no problem with self-defense, with guns, you know, their individual rights and freedoms and Jesus and the gospel. And they'll tell you all of these things. Like, they don't see any inconsistencies in these things. But listen, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to tell you, like, what do you do when somebody offends you? What do you do when somebody takes advantage of you? How do you forgive wrongs? And Jesus is going to tell you to do the exact opposite of what American culture would tell you to do. By the way, I'm just going to stop to tell you this, Victor. 
He's dead wrong. He is completely misappropriating the scripture from a theological term. He has zero clue what he's talking about. And I will, I would love to challenge him on this. I would love to go face to face on him with this. He's about to quote, uh, quote Greek. And when he answers a, uh, or w when he goes on, his Greek is horrible. He literally, Victor, I'm telling you this right now. He made up the definition literally is lying to these people. He made up the definition. And what he's trying to do is what the left does. He's trying to associate American culture, which was founded on biblical principles. He's trying to associate the idea of having the second amendment available to us, right? Remember the second amendment is the very thing that allows us to be able to keep the first amendment. Okay. People don't get that. They don't understand that, but he is trying to make it evil because this is what the left does. He's a gaslighter and he's lying through his teeth. He's not telling the truth. Now it could be that he's not lying and he's genuinely brainwashed. And even then he, he doesn't deserve to be in the ministry, but I'll, I'll continue on and let you listen to what he has to say. Cause it's really bad, right? This is the upside down kingdom of God. It challenges our natural propensities of what we think is right and defending our own rights and our own. Uh, one one other thing, when gaslighters do this, they use terms to get you to manipulate, to be manipulated by the emotional outbursting. So he's saying this is the upside down kingdom of God. That's a term that was inserted there on purpose because the meritorious function of his terminology cannot meet his statement, right? In other words, he can't back up what he's saying. So he's using manipulative terminology to kind of get you to see things his way. And then he brings in kingdom of God and so on and so forth. He's lying. We'll just continue on. Pride and place in this world. It's the upside down kingdom of God. It's a place where meekness is esteemed and honored. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay, before he answers this question, because it's even worse than his initial statement, what are your initial thoughts on what he's saying? Well, first, I'd like to take up an offering and uh, send him to a doctor to check his testosterone level. <laughs> uh, I'm just, <laughs> It's true. I mean, By the way, to me, I'm chuckling, going, and look, I I knew Charlo as a little kid. I taught him self defense as a as a wee little lad. But listening to the way he couches his position, it just sounds like he's a. Uh, it just sounds like he's scared, and and is trying to justify a position, a passivity based on he doesn't have the uh you know the wherewithal to to do something about it if he was ever confronted with a physical confrontation well that's he's, victor he's gonna address that in a second i i guess I, i'll just deal with the intellectual aspect of this I think we should take the offering and send him to school so that he can also become literate and stop using words that aren't even in the English language, right? Like my question to him is masculinity. And, 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 and then notice the over enunciation of the word. He's trying to emphasize something. He's, he's gaslighting. He's making stuff up. But you're going to be particularly disappointed because I know that you, you, you helped this young man. But I want you to look at the question here and... This guy is voicing it. He's challenging Char at this thing. He says, so this is what you said about the gun ownership thing. You know, I know Jesus did say you don't resist one person. If he slaps uh, one cheek, let him slap the other. He's going to continue on with the question, and I'll read it out loud because the question isn't being voiced. Let's just continue on, and I'll, I'll let you hear it. So right. this is, he's reading it right now. It'll, it'll add right now. The text will add. When it changes, I'll read it for you. Uh, but it seems uh, to me, with regards to personal disagreements and whatnot, don't you think that if an armed robber breaks into your house, you know the right thing is to defend your family? So what are you saying about? What are you talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I'm talking about a very extreme example of 
there are I mean, there are companies and bumper stickers. Made, you know, it's like God, God and guns. You know, it's like this whole idea that these two things go hand in hand, and there's no problem. It's like I, I will f let him finish in a second, Victor. But I just want you to know what the real issue is here. Is this is an anti president 45 comment this is an anti-right comment that's all it is it is an absolute political comment and i don't know if you noticed the subtlety before he even started i don't want to get into my own political preference but i've never taught a bible passage unconditionally saying i don't want to get into my own political preference he's being a politician here and a bad one for that matter but anyway we'll continue on because what he says is really horrible oh uh, i don't know if you've read the new testament so paul in Romans chapter 12. I don't know if you've read the New Testament. So he's putting a guy down. He's he's le he's literally seeking to elevate himself by putting... I don't know if you've read the New... This is a pastor. This is a pastor's conference. Or I think he's... Actually, it's not. He, it's a session that they're using to train their own people. So he's putting the people down. He's a typical arrogant leftist. But here we go. He gives us a command that is very, very interesting. So let me first say this. We as Christians have to hold intention to things. We are called to be peacemakers. We are called to receive wounds from people without retaliation. We're called to nonviolence. I mean, that's what scripture says. And at the same time, we are called to protect the weak and the vulnerable. Uh, one other thing, the scripture doesn't say that. It's a lie. The, the scripture actually calls us to be peacemakers. Me and you, by the way, understand this, and a lot of people understand this. Peace is not the absence of confrontation. As a matter of fact, confrontation is oftentimes necessary in order to establish peace. So he's already lying about the Bible. We'll continue. How do you I'm hold sorry, these two things it. in tension? Right? This is a question of ethics. This is difficult stuff. Listen to what Paul says in this is Romans difficult chapter stuff. 12. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, right? Tit for tat, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. So the word that Paul uses here, honorable, it means, the word actually means shocking. Liar. So as followers of Jesus, so hold on, let me just finish this and you can ask your question. As followers of Jesus, can, can our responses to the evil and violence of the world go above and beyond the way that the world normally responds? Can we respond in a way that would shock the world? Think about the way that God shocked the world in his love by giving his own life for us. This is an out of this world kind of love that God would respond this way to sinners. So I would say, take these uh, that idea and think about, man, what would that honor look like? He just called Jesus an evil man. I just want you to understand that because one word out of Jesus' mouth and he's going to eliminate a whole army of opposers and, and, and lied about that word. That Greek word does not mean that, doesn't even come close to meaning that. And I think I have a little bit of a gumption to be able to, uh, authority to be able to uh, come against that. He's wrong. Anyway, your thoughts. Well, what does he say about Jesus who took time to form and fashion a whip, throw tables over, smack people what about jesus telling peter after he chopped an ear off hey put that in its place he he didn't say it was time to melt it down he said put it in its place what does he say to jesus when jesus talks about hey sell your tunic if you don't have a sword you're gonna you know he knew his disciples would be traveling you know, uh, and there were marauders and evil people. It, it, it's it's an extreme <laughs> position, and I know people, and uh, I live with people who have put their life on the line. My wife's sitting back here, shaking her head at some of his statements because has he ever? risked his life to for the furtherance of the gospel? Nope. Has he ever gone to another country where 
what we did and how we've lived to help those in need. We were, I mean, we were, ISIS wanted to kill us. We've been shot at. We've been martyred. Uh, he, he takes a pretty high and mighty stance, not based on reality. And that's probably why I don't respect what he's saying. And it seems to be, and I don't know if Charles was hard on this, but again, I would say I, I've seen people who aren't true pacifists, but they use the scripture because honestly, they are just not equipped to handle the manifestation of violence. Um, and I tell people like him, what would you do if you came into a home and a guy was raping a little girl? He's going to answer what that. What would you do to stop him? He's going and, to answer that question. Yeah. Take, take a listen, Victor. This is going to break your heart. He's, he's going to answer that question because he's going to get asked that question. In other words, actually, he's going to say what would happen if someone was breaking into your house seeking to rape mm. your children and so on and so forth. Matter of fact, let me read the beginning of the imposition of this question. He says, so does that mean if someone threatens my life and I'm able to protect myself, should I, should I let it happen to me? That's, that's the question. And uh, let's, let's play. We'll see his answer. I think it means that you don't want to kill somebody. Yeah, but what if uh, I have a family to defend? Should I defend them? Yeah. yeah this, so this is the way I think about it, personally. And I think every, everybody needs to work this out. This is My wife and I have many, many conversations about this. Somebody breaks into our house. I don't own a gun. You know, I have some pocket knives. I'm probably not going to use those. You know, I don't know. I don't know how good they're going to be. <laughs> but somebody breaks into my house and their intent is to do harm against my family. I'm going to I'm going to do everything within my power to protect my family. I will I will lay down my life if necessarily to protect my family. And in doing so, I will not try to kill another human being. But I hear people all the time talk about things like this. Somebody walks into my house, I will blow their head off. And then simultaneously can sit in church and worship God and tell me that they're a Jesus follower. And I don't, I don't see those as being consistent with the way of Jesus. Okay, but I mean, uh, supposedly they do not su uh, succeed and uh, killing you. Who knows uh, what they're going to do to your family? Do you think by any means no. it's good to eliminate the threat? I think that I will rise from the dead one day. I mean, that's... I, that's he says, no, if my family dies, they'll rise from the dead one day. That's that's no. He says he'll rise. He'll from rise the from dead. the dead one day. I no. He said Not they'll rise from family. the dead. It, to me, listen to what he says here. I, that's uh, I think the biblical. We have a, we have a greater hope in heaven that cannot be taken away from us. If that's what happens to me and my family, you know what? We're gonna live in the new creation with Jesus forever. Even if they suffer horrifically before they are killed, uh, is it all right because you, you were all bought together? Is, is that right? I don't think it's all right. Yeah, but it's like since you all make it to heaven, ultimately, you know, as long as you can uh, get rid of the threat without killing him, you'll do that either... Uh, either then it'll be your life or their life. Uh, I if think you're, if you... If it's an armed robber who wants to kill your family, do you want them to be suffer before they're killed? Does this mean you want your family to suffer before they're killed? I think that killed? this is where I sit on this, and I don't claim that I would do the right thing in the right moment. But I pray to God that I have practiced the way of Jesus so much in my life that if I had the choice whether to kill somebody or to use restraint, that I would choose restraint. That's my hope. I don't think any of us in this room actually know the weight and guilt and shame that rests on somebody by taking another human's life. It's a lot of assumptions stuff. in that statement. And so I, it's just something that we have to wrestle with as believers as we grow in following Jesus. You don't have to answer this question today, but I think you'd have to think about it seriously. How about David and Goliath? David seemed to be justified killing Goliath because Goliath was, you know, a threat, uh, where you know killing yeah. Uriah was not. Uh, sure. That was murder with Goliath, but was it yeah. right to kill him? We have very different things going on in the Old Testament than we do in the New Testament. And this is before Jesus' command 
and his example to us. So under the new covenant, this is what Jesus commands us to do. As far as David goes, he had a different command that he was operating under. And so this wow. is probably a longer conversation. We can talk about it afterwards for sure. Absolutely. By the way, the idea of what he determines as a covenant is crazy. The commands in the covenant. Anyway, that's a whole other issue. You could The theolog theology behind that's really bad. But anyway, what do you think? You know, it, he's... I would be embarrassed if I was him. Yep. To to make statements like that regarding his family, just just as a man, as a provider, as a protector, um, and I would hope he'd at least talk to people who have killed people for righteousness' sake, to stop people who were put in a place that they had to kill someone or people who were monsters and and you should also talk to christians who've lived and lost people because of persecution um let me introduce him to a world of reality where a dad's holding up a toddler whose head has been cut off by isis <sighs> And the dad screaming for help because they had they stole his daughter and then killed her. L let him let him visit with real world people who suffer persecution. And I've never met a Christian in the Middle East who would do what he did and just lay down, or you know use restraint um i have i have it, it's here's what concerns me about that if it's just his own personal point of view he's got that men like me would say that he's fearful and that he's not prepared so therefore he's and and uh my wife would say the same thing. It, it's 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 something he's taking a position based on. It doesn't sound like biblical. He's trying to justify his point of view because there are millions of us out here who've done the deal, who understand what it's like to face evil, and you're left no other options but to uh, to kill or be killed. There's no restraint when horrible things are happening and and you know i feel bad for him i mean i honestly do but then at the same time because he's he's taking a position of leadership and trying to tell other people what they should do according to the bible very very dangerous and his reference to the old testament versus the new oh yeah he doesn't I, understand. I, yeah, I wonder if the Holy Spirit really did kill Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. <laughs> or was that just something made up? And that was only for lying, withholding truth. Um, I mean, Romans 13, the, the minister of God uh, executes judgment with the sword. I mean, is that, what does that mean? Does that mean he just shows it to somebody and uses it to wave? I, it, the, there's so many places like this. Yeah. He, he is blatantly, and the, the worst part about it, even is his understanding of the Bible is so badly diminished. For example, he says that the old covenant, this was a, these were laws and commands under the old covenant. Okay. First of all, Unless you are a hugely covenant theologian, if you, you kind of carry that kind of mindset, which you probably wouldn't be able to understand or articulate the ideals of it, commands under a particular covenant are not necessarily tied to one another. To, to, to actually say, well, this was under one covenant and so on and so forth. What he's trying to do is he's trying to nominalize or minimize a particular passage that he doesn't view as relevant in the current day. 
when you when you look at Jesus's proclamation in John where or John's proclamation about Jesus in John 1 1 he says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and then he goes later on and he says and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and then a few verses later he says the law was given through Moses and then it talks about grace and truth in the law uh, through Jesus Christ. It is realized in the law. It's not a comparison between the two. And then in Matthew, the same passage that he just quoted, in Matthew, Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it every jot and tittle. Jesus's fulfillment of the law is the very authority that we have to be able to be forgiven of our sins. Christ wouldn't have been able to forgive us of our sins if he didn't obey every word of the law. Let let me just talk from a... um, uh, a man's point of view that sadly he sounds like his dad. Yes. And Brian at one time, in his younger years was a boxer and, um, he, and let's go to his grandfather, Chuck. I heard Chuck Smith say from his mouth to my ears that he owned a weapon in his house and he would kill anybody trying to hurt his grandchildren very specifically. Um, And I don't know how they could fall that far from a biblical standpoint of protecting your family or the innocent and, and then go a step further to, you know, I'd say this, Charlo, if you're watching or listening, I remember you as a little kid and you, you, you had the wherewithal. I remember you fighting, sparring, and let me just tell you something from one man to a young man. If your wife was being raped or stabbed, or if one of your children, God forbid, was being hurt, you would, you would do everything in your power, not just assumptively, you would destroy the person. You would take a rock. If that's all you had and smash that guy's face in, and head in, you caved the skull. And I'll just say this, you haven't been put in that place, and I pray to God you never have, but you haven't seen what some of us have and what some of us have lived through. So at least, if that's your personal position, give a position for those who are warriors, who do stand in the gap, because without them, you won't be able to live your life of passivity and justify it. You may not like what we do, but you need us and those of us who stand in the gap so that chaos and evil doesn't rule. And man, I'm praying for you. And I invite you, your dad, y'all come out to our leadership and training center in Colorado. We've got, we've got combative courses. We've got, we'll put you in touch with your manhood again. <laughs> In a, in a way that would only fire you up and then see if you would discuss that. Brother, I got nothing else to say. That 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 kind of, that was just shocking and sad. Not, I, I, think, the, I think the best way we frame this, and, and seriously, I, I mean, the, what we just demonstrated to everybody is the very thing that we're fighting for on a regular basis. You know, it's what we fight for. I think of the Old Testament and one of my guys just reminded me of this. And Mason, thank you. Now, granted, he's a Homeland agent. So, I mean, he he gets it. But he reminded me of the fact, by head of security, he reminded me of the fact, he says, what about Nehemiah? You know, in chapter four, verse 17, you've got them, you know, working in one hand, putting the bricks on the wall while they've got a sword in the other. What was the sword for? You know, it, it's 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 sad. I think, look, framing this the way we frame it, it's it's really important to understand that the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because the fight is getting darker. And the adaptation of everything that we know on the left is continuing to destroy the church. And when the church gets destroyed, when the, when the ideals of the church get destroyed, when the heart of the church is destroyed, listen, there's, there's nothing left. Now, praise God, there's always going to be a remnant. And we know that God is going to hold back complete and total evil until the church is actually raptured. 
But that still does not absolve us from our responsibility for standing up for the truth. And I think this is, this is the biggest thing. As we're talking right now, I'm not kidding you, Victor. As we're talking, as me and you are having a conversation, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa has their CGN conference going on. And one of their keynote speakers is a guy named Ed Stetzer, who is in essence, one of the greatest propagators of critical race theory out there from Wheaton College, which of course is very, very propagandist, racist, and bigoted. They're so bad that they got rid of a Jim Elliott statue because of a notation about him going out and ministering to savages. Jeez. That, that Jeez. is the level of, of bigotry and racism that they're, that they're rising to. And this is, this is the mindset. And he's being heavily influenced by these guys. He's being heavily influenced by guys like Rick Warren and some of these other guys. And they say that they have nothing to do with it. Yet, while there were people that were suffering in your church, while there were people that were struggling, while crazy things were going on, while, while insanity was actually happening, the, the truth is, the reality is, is you continued, literally continued to put up your black squares, march, no, no uh, social distancing, no face masks, no anything. And I do think, I do think that it's peculiar that you would put things like that up. How about this? How about there's a video of him crying for George Floyd, saying that George Floyd was somebody who, who uh, literally uh, spread the gospel. He was, he was somebody that was used to that. Not true. It's a complete lie, but he hasn't taken it down. Or how about the fact that on his very Instagram page, he has a picture of him with Ravi Zacharias praising Ravi for the work of his life. And now that all of this has come out, he refuses to take that down. A man who refuses to, to defend the, the most vulnerable, you've got a problem with. That's the reality of it. Yeah. That's what we're dealing with. And that's why I fight the way I fight. Because the body of Christ is suffering. And as shepherds, we are called, as under shepherds, we are called to put ourselves on the line for those sheep. Yeah. And hey, on the point of Ravi, I, I knew Ravi. We've spoken at events together and whatnot. Look, factually, Ravi was a predator. That's a sad, it's a heartbreaking thing. Um, and I'm, it's so sad that the legacy that he left behind is that. But from a position of what we do, that's how he's classified, playing on women's emotions and using people. And God help us all. And I pray that none of us fall or even drift any bit. You, you know, I, I'd say this in closing, because I've got to run, is I'm, I'm thankful for what you do. And, and I pray God will raise up more men and women in a younger generation. You mentioned Charlie. We've spent the last two weekends uh, with Charlie Kirk uh, and his wife. I love him. But we've got to have people who understand we're in the days of Daniel. And, um, and we're not to give up our rights as Christian. And the Constitution was created to protect our God-given rights. We're not just to roll over. Uh, when we're persecuted for righteousness sake, yeah, we will suffer. And it's, it's not only coming, it's here, and it's going to increase. But please be aware, everyone, of those who didn't take a stand, those who didn't have a backbone for righteousness' sake, those who used the Bible to justify passivity. It's dangerous. Don't let your kids, don't let your, you know, my gosh, and men stand up. As far as Brian, I pray for him. You know, um, a lot of people don't realize I was on staff with Brian. I was his first junior high pastor when he first started in ministry at, at, uh, at the first church he pastored. He married my wife and I. And uh, somebody goes, well, was he a spiritual father? I said, no. They actually said, you know, he was your spiritual daddy. I, and I told a pastor, told me that I said, that's weird. Why would you even? That is the weirdest phrase said no he you know it's sad to see how far he's gone and unfortunately and the reality is 
he's becoming inconsequential. And you and I won't be having these conversations because God, hey, once God removes his hand, the work of the flesh it just won't sustain. Yeah, very And true. I pray that those that are on his payroll and salary, I pray y'all have the, the courage to stand up for what's right. And those who, who benefit from the wealth that was, you know, received by Brian because of the Calvary Chapel, everything that Pastor Chuck had did all those years, it's going to run out. And, you know, and I pray to God that Charlo, uh, you know, he just, God speaks to his heart or the men speak into his life uh, in, in a way that challenge him, not beat him down, but challenge him. And, uh, you know, I, I use humor to kind of get things across, but we're heading in dark, troubling days. Yes. Sir. And I pray that everyone re remember those who stood during the dark days and those who will stand. And I appreciate you, man. I appreciate your family, Me your too, sweet man. babies, and uh, the ministry that you have. And I pray if I ever drift, you call me on the carpet. Come on, bro. Uh, my phone first, <laughs> and then here. by media, if I post something that's stupid. And uh, and I pray people would give me grace as I'm, a, you know, again, I'm not your typical nice pastor. I, I, I think I'm a kind person doing the deal that uh, some, you know, many aren't called to do. Uh, but I, you know, uh, Right now, we're working on marriages. Right now, my wife and I have a marriage course out that it, it is 32 years of marriage, separation twice, me under psychiatric care, God restoring, and us doing things that I never thought possible. I mean, I'm, I know me. I'm just an ordinary guy that God is allowed to do some extraordinary things. Yep. And I think he has that for everybody. Amen. In whichever lane they're supposed to run in. But man, I appreciate people's prayers and support. And I appreciate everything Brian did for us in the early years. And I, I pray that he would rethink some of his positions and um, really view his dwindling leadership position in a way that he would end well. And Charlo, you know, if you're supposed to take over Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, I pray you'd have the courage to go beyond what some of the examples that you've seen. And and that's it, man. That's amen. That's it. Love you. Well, bro, Appreciate before we before we close it up, I just I want to only pray for our watchers. We do that all the time, but I also want to pray for you yeah. and uh, pray for your ministry and your bride and just the work that's being done over there because uh, that ministry is powerful. And uh, there's a lot of people that are alive because of the work that you've done, like physically alive. And uh, there's a spiritual work that's being done, too. I think that that people are getting excited and are growing. And, um, you know, not everybody has the body like me to be physically bold, but there's always the ability to be spiritually bold, you know. And yeah. I think of our founding fathers oftentimes, and I notice how they put everything on the line. They put their fortunes, they put their livelihoods, they put their reputations, they put everything on the, on the line to stand up for what's right. And, and I think that as believers, we have an obligation to do the exact same thing. God's given us so much. We need to put it all on the line and just let God be God and watch him do and, great and, things. And be encouraged by those pastors that are doing the deal. I mean, yeah, there are a lot. the Greg Downs, the Rob McCoys, the Jack Hibbs, uh, you know, th there's so many more. And then God's raising up people, uh, the younger generation, support them. At least let them know, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the stand because yeah. tough times are coming. It's, it's going to be worse than before. And, you know, sure enough, we won't even be wasting our breath on – people who aren't making a difference. We'll just be trying to encourage those that are taking a stand Amen. and are. And um, yeah, I would, you know, people, people have asked me, well, are you out there preaching the gospel? You know? And I said, well, actually I've been reduced to living it. You're and reduced. as God provides opportunity, <laughs> I, I do Amen. share. And I, I'll say this, I'll say this in closing. We were just in Baghdad. And I remember driving by a couple of ornament, 
huge Christian churches that were empty, right? Because of the aggressive hatred for Christians in that area and the rise of militias and terrorists. And here we are, we, we never were in the green zone. We stayed outside, but we went to a small little Christian church that was hidden. You'd never know it was a church. As a matter of fact, when we got there, there was a steel gate that huge that had to be open. And there was a guy with an AK who said, come in. We came in and you know what they ministered to? Orphans and widows. Wow. Orphans and widows. And Muslims are having dreams of Jesus and being directed there where they come and they knock on the door, (laughs) this big steel door. And they're just saying, Jesus sent me here. Um, I don't know what else to say. Some man in a dream named Jesus sent me here. And then this guy's ministering to him and loving him and helping him. And he tells him this, don't change your garb. Don't get out of your hajib. Don't change your name from a Muslim name to a Christian name because they'll be killed instantly. He says, continue to walk with the Lord, grow with him, and then listen to him. Don't do what people expect you to do. Just do what Jesus wants you to do. Amen. And I was listening to everybody listening and watching now. But yeah, man, pray, brother. Amen. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much, Lord, for your faithfulness and your goodness. And Lord, I just thank you for Victor and his precious bride and his family, Lord. And we pray first and foremost, your protection upon them, Lord, in the name of Jesus, just protect them, cover them from head to toe. Lord, fill them with your spirit and continue to give them insight and wisdom as into how you want them to live in these last days, Lord. We just love you, Father, and we thank you. And we pray, Lord, for all of those that are listening and watching. Lord, we just pray that you would encourage them and that you would build them up. And Father, just transform them, that they would walk away from this inspired, Lord. Not upset, not angry, not frustrated, but that they would walk away inspired, Lord, to just glorify you and to do what's right. So Lord, we love you, Father. Keep us looking to you and get us excited. Lord, as we approach the 4th of July, Lord, we know freedom was your idea. Lord, let us celebrate it, Father. That's our prayer of God. We just love you. We thank you. May we just uh, walk in freedom now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for having me on the Bro, your show, brother. I love, I love you. And stick around for just a minute as uh, as we close up. Folks, we love you so much. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for all of you folks that are uh, continuing to bless us, especially uh, as you've been given through super chats and uh, sending donations in and all of that stuff. Just your prayers. Those are probably the most important things. Your encouraging comments. You all are amazing. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge you. So with that, we love you guys. Listen, we may do another broadcast uh, on Friday or th- actually tomorrow. If we do another live broadcast, we'll do one tomorrow. Uh, but definitely Friday and Saturday, we won't do anything as we lead up to the weekend. However, we will be doing our daily videos and releasing a couple of them. Matter of fact, uh, really quickly, just so that you know, the one that's getting released today um, is uh, entitled The Contents of This Pandora Box Are Ugly. And we're going to talk about what's going on with Iran and Israel and the United States. And then tomorrow we're talking about Babylon. And uh, there's an interesting development with Iraq that we should probably put our focus on and attention on. It's coming. So anyway, we love you guys. God bless you. Keep your eyes on him. Seek him. And we've got a special announcement coming very soon about this YouTube channel. All right. God bless you guys. Keep your eyes on Jesus. We love you. Thank you, Victor, again. God bless you.